Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 127. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Have you turned your key and heard that dreaded tick, 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 tick because of a dead battery? No worries. I've got the NOCO Genius Boost Jump Starter. This compact tool fits in your glove box and features rechargeable lithium battery technology that will start a dead battery in your car, boat, truck, or RV. It packs a whopping 12-volt, 400-amp starting power and can start up to 20 dead batteries on a single charge. Plus, it has built-in spark-proof technology with reverse polarity protection to safely jumpstart your vehicle. The compact, ergonomically designed clamps are solid copper for maximum conductivity, and there's a built-in ultra-bright dual LED flashlight with seven modes, including an SOS emergency strobe. It's easily rechargeable with a USB outlet, and you can charge your smartphone or tablet while you're on the road. Works on any 12-volt lead-acid battery. The Genius Boost from NOCO is the ultimate emergency tool that's safe and easy to use. Quality design, state-of-the-art technology from NOCO, your battery care source since 1914. Get yours at GeniusChargers.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I'm really excited to introduce a very special guest, Roy Spencer. Roy, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I'm ready for liftoff, absolutely, yeah. (laughs) Okay, rocket ships firing. Roy Spencer has created MotorBinder. It's a beautifully presented photo book that leads the reader through a formative years of road racing in the United States. Its creative selection of over 321 pages and 21,000 words, along with carefully restored images, takes you on a journey with the great drivers and cars of the 50s and 60s. With an emphasis, I'm sorry, with an emphasis, On the human side of the sport, the images surprise and impress and weave a story of drivers and marks in that golden age of motor racing. MotorBinder is a must-have for every enthusiast library. Roy also contributes to AutoWeek, Cavallino, and the Star Magazines, and his classic Mercedes-Benz sales and restoration activities are well known in the Marks Global community. So Roy, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a moment and share some more about your history? your business, your interest, and, of course, your passion for automobiles. Sure, that'd be fine. This is, there's been a lot of momentum behind what I do today and my connection with the automobile business. I would say I'm a, I'm a third-generation uh, automobile enthusiast. Uh, my grandfather began in the automobile business in the early part of the last decade, and uh, his passion led to my father picking up the passion of for automobiles and automobile racing. Uh-huh. My father uh, ended up sharing a Buick dealership in San Francisco beginning in the middle 50s with my grandfather. And uh, my father exposed us to all the great cars, the hobby, yeah. over the years. And it was basically impossible for me not to, to pick that up. So I picked <laughs> it up. And also with a great influence from my brothers, uh, led me through uh, years as early on in the business as a being involved in the service service end of the automobile business and mm-hmm. later led to me becoming uh, a small independent uh, classic automobile dealer and, and gravitated towards Mercedes-Benz. I think that was influenced by my brother, Tony Spencer, who's been selling new Mercedes for almost four years now. So oh, wow. in, uh, it's been a long but somewhat predictable road, I suppose, uh, which has led me to uh, where I am today, uh, enjoying being involved in the classic Mercedes men's business and really being passionate about the, the vintage uh, motor racing world as well. Sure. Well, the, the book that you've created, Motor Binder, when we had uh, Randy Nonnenberg on the show here from Bring a Trailer, he suggested that I give you a call, and he really speaks highly of, of your book. He says it's one of the first books he always grabs. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came to be? One of the social contacts that my father picked up uh, when he was involved in motor racing in the early to mid-60s was he got to know the different media personalities in the Bay Area, and and one of the great personalities was uh, Gordon Martin. He was the motorsports editor of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Mm -hmm. So we got to know Gordon very well, and Gordon was really a very active, uh, active journalist in that realm. 
and a guy who always carried his camera around. And, and I should say my father also hired cameramen and photographers to follow his exploits as he uh, campaigned uh, racing cars and uh, in the Northern California. He used that PR to market Spencer Buick. Uh, so we developed this archive of photographs, not only of my father's cars and, and racing experiences, but eventually I was able to acquire Gordon Martin's collection of, uh, of images when he passed six, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So there was this enormous treasure trove of really unusual images and a lot of images that had never been seen before. They were being published. They've just been languishing for years and years. Uh, and I, I had in the back of my mind that something really should be done with the images to ex expose them to the community. Mm -hmm. So it, we were pondering different ways to do it, uh, whether to create a website, to put the images out there, to be bought and shared. And I began the process of digitizing this archive uh, a year or so ago and, and hired a very interesting young man who had a degree in photography and was, a, was a, uh, an archivist by profession. And he and I were discussing ways to uh, manage this massive group of photos. He and I came up with the notion of using this uh, Kickstarter platform to raise some money and, and help the process. And, and Kickstarter really requires that there's some sort of end game to your campaign. And that end game became to be a book. So that's how we focused on the book. It was uh, it was the end game for the Kickstarter, Kickstarter fundraising campaign. Very cool. You know, I had Jesse Alexander, the photographer on Cars, yeah, and he did the same thing with one of his books that led to a success. So Kickstarter is such a, it's such a great new concept for people to do their own projects, publish their own books, and, and have more control than the old school way of publishing books and uh, going to publishers and virtually losing control in many cases of your project. Right. Yeah, yep. that's fantastic. I love that. As we continue on your journey, I always like to start the show with a success quote. And this is a saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a really great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So, Roy, take the wheel. It's a cliche, of course, but I've operated in my business with the mindset of really trying to treat people as I wish would, would wish to be treated. You know, it, it relates to respect and, and honesty, something that is so often lacking in the automobile business in general, and certainly in the classic car business. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple uh, practice. It's not always practiced by different people in the, in the business. And this is something that I was... That's how I was raised. My parents raised all of us. I'm, I'm one of seven kids in you know, respect and honesty. So that's really served me well. I'm, I've been known as a guy who over-prepares my, my cars. I don't have complaints, and I think I have a good reputation in this realm, and it, it, it just really boils down to, to uh, providing, uh, being, being honest with the product that I sell and, and uh, and respecting the buyers. Sure. So that, that old golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, basically. Very simple, but it's been working really well for 25 years. The old days of you always walked away feeling like I got fleeced a little bit or what's going to happen. So uh, definitely a way to keep yeah. your reputation growing. And, and the world of ca the car hobby world is so small. Once you... Uh, Good reputation gets out there. Everybody starts talking about you and saying, "Oh, he's you know, Roy's a great guy to deal with." So that's a yeah, great, great way absolutely. to run your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you share a story with me that instigated your passion for cars? Was there a pivotal moment you can recall in your life when you really knew you were a car guy? <laughs> the passion for automobiles was pretty much preordained. Uh, <laughs> the day I came home from the hospital. I was born in January 27, 1955. One of the first cars I was aware of was when I got home, I was carried past the almost new uh, Gullwing with Spencer Buick beater plates on it sitting in our driveway. So, oh, wow. <laughs> it, 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 there was really no other path. Father was very active in that world. Gee, even when I was very young, there were three older brothers who... <laughs> Were, had been learning all about the world of cars and interesting cars and racing cars. So that was the conversation that was going on at home. You mm -hmm. know, it was uh, it was interesting automobiles. And when my father began to uh, 
take us all to the races. It, it was just nothing but automobiles and racing cars. I, at an early age, I drew cars. My mom kept all our schoolwork from grade school, and you know, we would do our Monday morning little news reports, and it would be my news report would be on Laguna Seca uh, race results uh, <laughs> and, and what my father had been doing. So Very cool. There was just no other way. Based, there was no base, thought of baseball or other hobbies. Um, really immersed in it at, at, at the house with my brothers and my father. It was, yeah. it was, uh, it was <laughs> no, life. No a life in the Spencer home. Yeah, and it brought everybody together. We were all we all had this similar passion, so we were all moving in in the same direction. So it was yeah. uh, it was uh, it was an easy path. Fantastic, Roy. What I'd love to do now is uh, take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and, and crawl under the hood here and ask if uh, there's a moment in time where you had a huge challenge or even a great failure that you faced that you could share. But more importantly, tell us about how you overcame that and what you learned from that situation. The biggest professional challenge that I went through, I, 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 was, a, I was a very young uh, service manager. I, I managed service departments for some domestic car dealerships here in, here in Burlingame. And uh, that was really a challenge. That was really very, very difficult. That was 12 hours a day of, of headaches and, and, and often agony. And uh, I think the only way I survived was because I was so young and I had the energy to to sail through it. Um, sure. And I had enormous patience. I think mean, it's something I, I inherited from my my grandfather. Lots of lots of patience, but it was it was very very difficult. And, and after four or five years, ultimately, I really had to say I, I need to step out. I, I had to step out. It was uh, definitely not a path that was going to be a long term thing for me because of the stress. So that's that's when I decided to take a break and, and uh, I wanted to go and try my hand at selling cars. Mm-hmm. But I learned quickly that having a lot of knowledge about automobiles and the technical aspect of automobiles, <laughs> it, it didn't uh, transfer it, uh, necessarily into being able to actually sell automobiles. So oh, okay. <laughs> I, I went and I sold Volvos at the Mercedes dealership that my brother worked at and I was a failure. I got, I was fired. You know, I, I, I didn't, know how to sell cars. I knew all about cars, and I probably talked way too much about the technical end, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a certain skill to sell. So there was a failure. I was uh, I was fired at, uh, at Volvo and um, tried again and locally here at a dealership, and I was um, uh, fired, actually, again oh, no. uh, at a second Volvo dealership, but they gave me the opportunity to sell new Jaguars uh, at a dealership that they just acquired. This is Bob Cole in Burlingame. Mm-hmm. So they, they said, well, we, we can't use your Volvo anymore. Would you, If you'd like, you can go to our new Jaguar store and sell Jaguars. And I moaned and groaned about that, but I went ahead. This was in 83, and it was basically at the pivot point for Jaguar where they became extremely desirable. So then I was, I was off and running, and I became one of the top uh, Jaguar sales people in the West United States, it didn't hurt that I I knew basically every other client that walked in the door. It was a very local group of buyers for these cars. So, mm-hmm. so after a couple of failures, uh, I was off and running selling uh, Jaguars. Would you say that the success came because uh, you mentioned you knew most of the buyers, but but was there something different about Jaguar and the way that they needed to be sold that created the success for you? Absolutely, it was uh, it was a soft sell. It was a matter of, uh, of really uh, trying to connect with the with the buyers. And oh, I was okay. Able to do that because of your passion for cars, uh, of my my passion for cars, and the fact that uh, I was from the area, and a lot of, uh, of these buyers knew my parents, and I so th- there was a, a good connection there, and that gave me the confidence actually to become a more successful salesman. Okay. I had some success, some easy success initially, and then uh, I became quite a good salesperson. <laughs> I see. Okay, that makes sense. That's great. Let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum and share with me a real aha moment in your career, a time when you realized that an idea or a concept that you had was really going to be successful, and, and tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into that success. Well, I don't know about how much success it created. Uh, I would say a big aha moment was uh, late in my 
Jaguar sales career in 89 and early 1990, it was obvious that Jags, the song Jaguars was not the place to be. The XJ40 had been introduced with a lot of hoopla, and it was turned out to be a very, very troublesome car. So I, I saw the writing on the wall that the Jaguar sales were going to collapse, which they did. That really prompted me to give some thought to becoming a, a, an independent businessman, and uh, uh, and that's what what pushed me to to uh, leave the formal sales world and and open my automobile business. That, mm-hmm. that's, so that that was that was a big change for me, and uh, it uh, really really forced me to uh, be disciplined and, and set up a little business, and it's been. 25 uh, odd years down the road. <laughs> That's great. How about proudest moments? Is there one in particular you can think of that was a really proud moment in your career? I think that's just, uh, just happened last week. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was contacted by, uh, Bonhams, the, uh, the auction house. Oh yes. Uh-huh. Uh, they ordered 60 of my new motor binder books to give to their top clients as Christmas presents. Oh, so I, I, that's perfect. Really, yeah, after this long slog to put the book together, uh, that was really uh, gratifying. That it was a big validation of, of what I'd done. So uh, mm-hmm. that, that, was, that really felt good. That really felt good. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's a great story. Well, let's have a little bit of fun here. How about your first really special car it may have been your first car but something that was really special to you and could you share maybe a memory or two you have with that vehicle i bought what i would consider my first ferrari and i i was raised on all the great ferrari berlinettas of the 50s and 60s and and uh, so i wanted to somehow recapture that without spending enormous money. So I bought in, in the late 80s, when I was selling uh, new Jaguars and making a little money, I bought a, it was a great car, and, and I think still is, I, I bought a 72 365 GTC4. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. which we, we could, I think it's considered the Daytona's more civilized uh, brother, and less expensive <laughs> brother. Yeah. It was just a fantastic car. It made just this glorious, enormous noise. Uh, it was drivable, power steering, uh, just a just a gorgeous car. I had a lot of fun with that car. A lot of fun. Really fun car to drive. I look forward to my days off uh, at Jaguar. It was usually during the week, and I'd get, my, get in the C4 and and uh, blast down Highway 1 to Monterey or to Santa Cruz for lunch, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that car. Yeah, those Ferraris, they bring out just I don't know what it is. It's the sound, the smells, the the motion, whatever it is. But they're they're pretty pretty darn awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, a lot of fun. Four, four cam, four point four liter. Great, just a great car. Really, just I felt like I was on top of the world when I drove that thing. <laughs> awesome. How about seller's remorse? Is there a vehicle that you've let go that you really wish you could have back in your garage? Well, that's a good question. There've been quite quite some cars. I think it's a, it's an E-type. It's an E-type Jag. Oh. I, I bought uh, from up up your way in the Pacific Northwest in uh, probably the middle '90s. I bought an absolutely drop dead gorgeous, nothing bolt Concorde restored uh, '65 E-type fixed head coupe. And it was so beautifully done. Uh, Carmen red. Uh, it had some really tasteful. Modifications lowered a bit. It had Series Three E type wider wheels. It was just gorgeous. Fully sorted. It was also a car that I would use for my my runs down the Highway One down the coast here uh, for for my days off and lunches. So mm-hmm. That was really an exceptional car. I'm a great fan of E types. I've owned probably fifty E types over the years. Oh my gosh! Um, that was that was an epic E type. Uh, I sold it to to, uh, it was actually it was hard to sell back then for some reason. But I, I sold it to a client in Japan, and, and I, he still has the car. So yeah. th- that's a car I wouldn't mind having back. Awesome. Beautiful. Love love the XKEs. They're so cool. How about current projects? Is there something you're working on right now that really has you excited and fired up? Well, the Motor Binder book promotion uh, is exciting. The reviews are just now hitting various magazines. I work really hard to 
make uh, all the major classic car magazines and uh, websites aware of the book. That's been really interesting. I've met so many great people via the book and uh, the Kickstarter program, book signings and working on the holiday marketing. Mm-hmm. That's really what's going on right now. It's, it's kind of quiet on the on the classic car side. I just finished uh, recommissioning a, a European model Mercedes uh, 84 500 SL, which I pulled out of New Jersey. I've been sitting for 10 years in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. That car, was finishing that car up. And interestingly, I sold it to a supporter of the Kickstarter Motorbinder project who owns uh, a Ferrari uh, short wheelbase Bronetta. Nice. My father owned way back when. Oh, my so gosh. He's been a great, he was a great supporter of the project, of the book project. Mm-hmm. Uh, he happened to see that I, I posted this 500 SL on, on my Facebook page, and he saw it and said I, he had to have it. So, nice. Um, if it's going to go on a truck, you're shortly head out to him. We finished up preparing the 220 SC Cabriolet as well. So it's pretty quiet in the car front right now. <laughs> well, we'll be letting our listeners know how they can get their hands on one of your books here a little bit later in the show. But first, I've got a funny question for you. If you were a car, what kind of car would Roy Spencer be and why? <laughs> okay, that's a tough one. I'm not sure if I really can equate myself to an automobile. Well, I, I think in terms of Mercedes, that's that's what I'm focused on. It's your life. <laughs> I, I guess it would be, uh, yeah. I, I guess it would be a, a 300 SEL 6.3. Oh uh, wow! <laughs> the uh, Q car, Mercedes Q car, the hot rod sedan. Uh huh. Why do you say that? What is it about that car that you think associates your personality with that vehicle? Well, I, it's an understated car, definitely very understated. It's just kind of a sleeper. I would say it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an understated and powerful automobile. It makes that kind of statement. And I'm, um, I'm a pretty quiet guy, pretty understated guy, but I'm a strong and powerful individual, there I think. You go. So yeah. I think that, uh, that's it. Perfect. Well, that's, that's why I enjoy asking that question because it, it does, make the guests think a little bit about who they are, how they perceive themselves, a little introspective, but uh, that sounds great. Yeah. Those are wonderful cars. I like your answer. Okay, Roy, we're ending what I call the last lap, and this is where I'm going to fire off a series of questions, and you give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? That came from a Dutch client of mine a few years ago. And he's uh, he's been encouraging me to avoid uh, big restorations at all costs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's no, no, no more no more massive restorations. That's uh, they're, a, they're yeah. agony and a good recipe for losing money. So that would be a that, yeah that, that's that's good automotive advice. Yeah, I think unless you have a, a very deep pockets and a lot of patience. I've heard that from many of my guests, is find somebody yep. else's restoration and buy it after it's all done and go enjoy the car. So that's yeah, great absolutely. advice. Yeah. Could you share with our listeners a personal habit that you believe has contributed to your success? Well, I'm a great practitioner of, of yoga. So I, I, oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm six, seven days a week practicing power yoga. And that's something that really strengthens not only the physical body, but the mind is, as well. It's uh, that that really helps keep things settled and keeps me clear and focused. Uh, at the end of each day, it, it tends to wash away the day's stresses and kind of resets the emotional clock. And and uh, it, it's been great for me, really great. Yeah, it is a great thing. My father's eighty four, and he does yoga every day as well. And fantastic, good for him. Great thing to do for yourself, mind and body and spirit. How about resources? Is there a resource you're really fond of that you could share with us? Perhaps it's a website you really enjoy or a blog you receive? Well, as far as a resource in the Mercedes-Benz realm, I think the Mercedes Classic Center in Irvine is overlooked and and not well-known. People, Mm, I I get calls and contacts daily. Where do I get parts for my classic Mercedes? And uh, the Classic Center in Irvine is... It's a great source. They're responsive, and of course, they're going to have the, the best selection of the of the bits and pieces. So, I think that's that's a good resource for someone who's navigating the classic Mercedes Benz world. Uh, great resource. That's a great center. They do some amazing work down there, and 
You're right. Yeah. I, I, you don't see it advertised a lot. Yeah. Um, so that's a great resource. We'll make sure that we post that up on your show notes page. How about books? Other than, of course, your book, is there a book that you've read recently that you really found interesting or maybe in the past that you could share with our listeners? just bought a lovely book that was put together by a, uh, a Swiss guy. It's called, I think it's called, called Weekend Warriors. Uh, it's out of print, but a uh, great, great book. I don't have it with me at the moment. Mm-hmm. Hardbound uh, book that covers similar topic as I covered, uh, road racing in, uh, in the United States, early 50s to latter 50s. Or it might be Weekend Heroes. I'm sorry, I don't have it exactly. Great book. Great book. Okay, we'll see if we can find that and put that up on yeah. your show notes page. I'll remind our listeners you can find these resources at carsyeah.com slash Roy Spencer. All right, Roy, we're up to the checkered flag, and this last question can be a real doozy for some people, especially a guy like you who had so many cars. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, and it's something you can't sell to buy a bunch of other cars with, so that little trick's off the table here, you're going to have to keep it. But money's no object. I'm going to buy you whatever you'd like. What would that vehicle be and why? I pondered that for some time. It would have to be uh, one of my father's cars. My father was a, a Ferrari dealer in the early 60s to 65 or 66. And we had a, some of the first 275 GTBs on the West Coast. Ooh. My father was race chairman for Laguna Seca's big USRRC race. And he thought that to improve safety of Laguna, that there should be a guardrail placed outside uh, Turn 4, which he had done. It was installed. He and I did an overnighter down to, uh, to Carmel in one of the first two Sunny Fire GTBs on the West Coast. And it happened to be one of these special Cliente GTBs, which had alloy coachwork, outside fuel filler, big tank, uh, six carb cars. So, you know, it was one of the few times I had a one-on-one little road trip with my father with seven kids. That was tough for him to do. Right. Uh, so we, we cruised down uh, in this wonderful new Ferrari and uh, went out to the track, inspected the, the guardrail, got some pictures. So that, that's a car that would be uh, not only a great car, but um, really would remind me of a great trip I had with with a father who was really busy <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and had seven kids uh, and a wife to, to keep happy. Uh, uh, so that would be a car that would really roll everything up into one car. It's, it's a little pricey. I think, I think one of the other Clancy cars sold for $12 million last August. So that'd be a little pricey. But, yeah. Uh, well, don't worry. I, I'm paying for it. So it's no big deal. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. So great, uh, great car and a great trip. Yeah, what a wonderful memory. That's fantastic. Great choice, great choice. Well, Roy, you've taken us on a great ride today, and I've really enjoyed your stories and had fun getting to know you here. I want to thank you for sharing your journey with the Cars Yeah listeners and with me. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that 275 GTB? (laughs) I wish, yeah. (laughs) You know, going through the book process and the archival process, People out in the community that are hearing this that have have historical information, have photographs, family photographs, or photographs that, that uh, they've taken uh, over the years hidden away, I would encourage everybody to make an effort to, to, to pull those uh, photographs out and automobilia out and make some effort to expose the stuff to the greater community. You know, that's one thing I learned about the book project. And I, I also want to you mention websites that I, that I enjoy. I want to mention the, the new, uh, the Revs Institute. Uh, oh, yes. Collaboration between the Collier Museum and Miles Collier Jr. and Stanford. Uh, the Revs Institute Digital Library is really an example of this. They're soliciting photographs. The Revs Institute Digital Library is absolutely mind-boggling, and I'm finding so many pictures of, of my family and our old cars uh, in there. It's, it's just amazing. Don't let the straight uh, heritage languish in, a, in boxes in the, in the attic. Get them out and share them. You know, it's funny you mentioned the REVS program because I've been trying to get Riley Brennan, who runs that program, on Cars Yeah. So maybe if he's listening, Riley, give me a oh, call. Yeah. Let's promote maybe. the REVS program to more people. But I uh, appreciate you mentioning that. What's the best way for our listeners to learn more about your book, Motor Binder, and get a 
get one on in their hands. Yeah, easy enough. It's uh, motorbinder.com. Easy. Very easy. Okay, great. Well, you know, it is the holiday season here. This show goes live on Thanksgiving Day, so uh, it's time to start your Christmas holiday shopping. So uh, be a great gift for your motorhead friends, something that they would cherish for the rest of their lives. So make sure that you uh, check out the show notes page here on Cars Yeah for Roy Spencer. And go there, get your hands on one or two or three or more of his books if you have a bunch of car buddies, and send them off. And Roy, how about a website for your Mercedes-Benz business? Well, that's uh, that would be MercedesHeritage.com. Lots of cars and lots of educational information, a lot of articles I've written. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a neat uh, site for uh, Mercedes enthusiasts. Great. Well, I'll make sure I include that on your show notes page. Roy, I want to thank you for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and and for sharing your experiences with me and the listeners. It's been great fun. Until we talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Great fun. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!